It won't be long. We're going to get into the person politicians thing and not going to be very happy about that. But in the meantime, relax and enjoy it. We're not going to go there today. With personalities and uh, perspectives. Um, Steve will remember that. We always try to start. Uh, I know he remembers that because he's so smart about those well, things. Well, he is yeah. smart. Yeah. <laughs> um, How do you think he got where he is? <laughs> seriously, we always try to start Viewpoint with a uh, kudo or two for the community. And uh, lo and behold, I read this morning, uh, Golden County Farm Bureau, a venerable organization, been around forever and ever and ever. And they have various good org- sub-organizations in it, and one of them is the Youth Leaders. And I noted where uh, they got together and raised some significant money by way of $8,500 and $8,529, I think it was. And they gave it to the local food pantry. Good. Which is a great thing to do. Uh, there's an organization that goes along uh, week after week, uh, unsung, uh, but doing a tremendous amount of good for a lot of folks who need it. And maybe some who don't really need it to show up and work the system. And we, <laughs> we've, uh, we've been told that a cash donation is uh, so appreciated by them because they can go to this store that's just for food pantries. It's in Springfield, if I, I remember correctly. I think that's correctly. correct. I think you're right. And uh, they can buy for pennies on the dollar uh, with their uh, cold hard cash all these foodstuffs. So that's appreciated. So well, hats it's off a, it's to a, them. It, it's, there are a number of people who have a serious need and uh, thank God that's there for them and so uh, kudos to the old County Farm Bureau young leaders uh, come up with 8500 bucks for them that's a big deal very big deal now uh, with regard to uh, what's going on in the community uh, I received a request from uh, Carrie Adams Judith to try to appear uh, on viewpoint to uh, t- talk about the need for volunteers for the upcoming balloon fest well, the time is such that we just couldn't work that in because that's uh, coming up here very quickly. Uh, matter of fact, in a couple weekends now. And uh, so I told Carrie that we would uh, put out a plea for volunteers. Projects like this are really hard to put on uh, with just a few people. This requires a lot of people. And uh, when, when they don't have volunteers, a lot of things fall by the wayside. And if Carrie were here, I'm sure she could tell you the various needs for volunteers. But uh, Judy and I would like to, uh, and I'm sure uh, Jim and Steve too, would like to urge folks who have a little time uh, to get a hold of uh, Carrie Adams at the Logan County Alliance. And uh, that number would be uh, 735-2385. 735-2385. Uh, a lot of folks have a little time. Uh, it doesn't require a lot, but it would sure uh, lessen the burden. Now, I know, for instance, uh, in a service organization here uh, in town, they furnish drivers with the little go-karts, or the golf carts to run around. Well, it's difficult even to find enough drivers for those things. So uh, the need is great, and I'd urge uh, some of you uh, older people who... Uh, are out and about and can get out and about and there's some younger people who are retired uh, uh, or could find some time so uh, get a hold of Carrie Adams at uh, Golden County Alliance 735-2385 uh, give him a little time you'll be uh, happy you did now we're going to get to Steve but I got something I got something I'm to just, I'll you just want, talk yes. among myself you okay. go ahead you just join right in because I have something else I want to talk about did that, you want to make some com- comments about that Judith no, except I've done that. It volunteered for that. You volunteer a lot in this community, well, girl. Well, but I tell you what, it, not only does it matter to those who put the balloon fest on, but it's fun for those who volunteer there. So, uh, you know, it's a twofer. It's good for the Alliance, it's good for the Balloon Fest, and it's good for the guy who volunteers. Say, I think I, I, kind of, I think we've got about 29 balloons, including this new one that looks like a ship, an old, uh, uh, an old um, uh, tall sail ship. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, that's kind of, I saw the configuration. It was quite new. The other day, I was at the uh, IGA, a great store here in, uh, in Lincoln. We're going to get to you, Steve. 
Uh, uh, you I just was, talk among yourself, too. I, I bring this up because it, it, it's a little side issue, uh, uh, a kind of a peek into uh, human interest, if you will. I was standing there at the deli counter waiting for getting Gene's chicken that we had to take up to Canton, and uh, this gentleman was standing there waiting patiently, and it was hot. It was going to be really hot that day. I think it was a week ago Saturday. And uh, he obviously was a knight of the road, the way he got up, and he, and he had a very large, what I call perambulator, the old baby carriage, all f f dock full of stuff, and uh, you knew what he was, he was on the road. So I struck up a conversation with him, and I just simply said, hope you're taking a lot of water with you there, partner, because it's going to be a tough day out there. And that led to a slight exchange back and forth. That's just the cat wants in. She, now the cat wants out again. So <laughs> cat's in the studio, out of the studio. <laughs> so don't say we're cruel to animals, okay? <laughs> this, is a, this, is, this is the Atlanta branch of the SPCA. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, this uh, gentleman sitting on the bench there, what I call a hallowed bench in the IGA. That's a bench that I used to sit on when I got haircuts, and that would be in the late 1920s. And that was in a barber shop on Peoria, uh, no, the Chicago Street. Anyway, the guy gave me a little slip of paper, and he was walking from Chicago to Los Angeles. Walking. And I asked him how many days he'd been on the road, and he said, I think he told me 13 days getting from Chicago to Lincoln. He must have gone by way of Delavan. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> in any event, uh, he gave me this card. And on it, uh, it showed a little map of what he was expecting to do. And he says, why am I doing this? And it says, uh, because I can. <laughs> <laughs> so that was his rationale. Anyway, Indian by uh, birth, uh, Rashid Huda. Anyway, he had his email address on there. Last night before I went to bed, I just, well, just see where that gentleman is. So I sent him an email. But lo and behold, this morning I had an answer from him already. He's about 20 miles west of St. Louis. And uh, thanked me for being in touch. And it occurred to me, and I, Jim and I talked about this, that we, every Wednesday, I'm going to work it out with him first before we do this, but I thought we'd try to contact him every Wednesday and see where he is. So I'm going to try to set that up. But I thought it was very interesting. Guy on the road and... Uh, 20 miles this the uh, week go uh, Saturday that's another 10 days just 20 miles west of uh, St. Louis Oof-da. he might have had a hard time climbing Elkhart Hill <laughs> <laughs> the only people well, in Logan let's County. get down to serious business because we got a serious guy here today and we had uh, too much preliminary go right ahead Judith K. well, well he, he's not opposed to fun are you Steve uh, absolutely not that's <laughs> right Steve Siltman heads up the Logan County Paramedics Association. Now there may be those of you out there who haven't made their acquaintance, but uh, there are those of us out here <laughs> who have certainly made their acquaintance. I think over the years that poor Buzz was so sick, I, sick, I met every one of your people, probably, because they used to come yeah. a lot. Yeah. Yeah, and every did. one of them is nicer and more competent than the one before them. They are a special breed of cat. And in Luke's case, bigger. And, and in <laughs> Luke, Luke Hanger's place, a bigger boned boy, yes. Um, and it, it made me hark back when I was thinking about visiting with you today, Steve, to the days when the paramedics first got together. That was at the old building of the hospital. That's correct. And you've been with them for a good long while. And when they first got together, they were number one in the state of Illinois as far as their professionalism was concerned. And I'm sure that if they have that contest again today, you'll win once more. Well, uh, uh, that may be... Uh, uh uh, subject to opinion, uh, but that's my uh, opinion, well, we, Steve. We can make it our opinion, make it stick. <laughs> you want the opinion, sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, I I, I was looking, uh, I was thinking about that this morning. I was thinking, how long have you been uh, doing this? And it, it was, it's been a, absolutely a career for me. I started when I was 21. <laughs> I'm 62, still at it. Ufta. And uh, you know, people ask me, well, how much longer are you going to be doing this? I don't know, probably until I get tired of it or whatever, but I'm still not tired of it. 
uh, it's been a good uh, run for me, uh, a good fit for me, I guess I should say. Mm -hmm. uh, and and as I, uh, the historically speaking, um, prior to 1971, the ambulance the ambulances were provided by the funeral homes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, on a rotating basis. You're right. Uh -huh. And I think uh, Fricky uh, from uh, Mount Pulaski at the time had one. And Holland, uh, Holland and, and Barry. Barry had one. Yeah. Uh, John Barry had had an ambulance. And I think mm -hmm. when it switched over to the hospital uh, administering the uh, ambulance service, I think John Barry uh, donated that ambulance to this. I think he may have donated an ambulance to the service because that we started out with that old Cadillac. Think of that. Uh -huh. And uh, kind of grew from there. But uh, the uh, I think in 77, we went to, uh, uh, those of us that worked for the ambulance service went to uh, St. John's and at Springfield and took the first downstate paramedic <coughs> uh, course. Uh, prior to that, it had only, only been in Chicago. And then, so for as far as downstate, that was the first uh, class. And uh, when we got finished and so forth with that, uh, and because of the fact that we worked so closely with doctors and nurses in the emergency department, I think the combination of those two uh, presented itself in a situation where the medics were far and above um, uh, just better training, better, uh, just a better setup than well, what you would normally one, see. Well, number one, Steve, for crying out loud, it really was. I remember that from that old time day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I'd like to mention something very specific here, and that not many people know today, or maybe some of us older timers have forgotten this thing. But the genesis of today's Logan County Paramedic Association kind of started with Dr. Gene Blum and, it, and the impetus that he started, and he kind of kick-started that, didn't he? Absolutely. With, with not only his ideas, but his own treasure, his the own money. The reason why it is very simple. He was, uh, I think he did two tours in Vietnam yep. as a flight surgeon. He was a, he was a physician before he went, uh, was commissioned. Um, I think he was a captain um, in the army, I believe, but uh, he was a flight surgeon. And <clears throat> because of the fact that he had such close uh, working with the field <coughs> military medics and saw what they could do and what they, uh, the good that they were doing, he wanted to bring that back uh, here. And of course, uh, you know, in the early 70s, it was beginning to, the paramedic concept was really beginning to to uh, catch hold because there was a, a, a television program called Emergency back then and everybody was like, wow, this is really cool. Mm -hmm. um, but but it kind of caught on. Uh, he and Emil Stahlhut uh, wanted this program to, to work and so they together, I think, were the really were the nucleus. Obviously there was many other people that sure, were involved right, yeah. in that, but mm -hmm. I think the nucleus was were those two individuals. And of course, Dr. Blom has always been a friend of the paramedics and always been there to train us uh, and uh, be beside us and uh, he was just always such a great um, advocate for the paramedics. Well I guess uh, a local, local physician kind of was a kickstarter for today's Logan County Mentor, uh, uh, Paramedic Association. Pretty I much. thought that was kind of neat history. Pretty much mm -hmm. yes and you know in the early days when it wasn't so set. Um, it, I mean, nowadays, uh, the, what we do out in the field is pretty much national standards. Very sophisticated. Very sophisticated. Back in those days, it was uh, kind of going through its growing process. And because of that, Dr. Blom um, trusted us enough to be able to teach us many different um, um, procedures that, that really weren't normal at that time. Um, things that he'd learned in his own training? Things that he knew how to do, uh -huh. things that he felt that there was no reason why we couldn't uh, do some of those procedures out in the field. And, and so we had great success uh, uh, in, on, on that arena. Uh, and, I, and I still believe that he was w w chiefly the reason why we were uh, so successful at what mm -hmm. we did. So here we are today out on the west side of town. I can't even remember the name of that uh, Parkway, where you, where you're, we're on, we're on Lincoln Parkway. Lincoln Parkway, yeah, the yeah, old right. 66. Yeah. So, you have a very sophisticated operation out there. You have a nice facility. 
uh, certainly far from plush, but uh, adequate for uh, your staff. Uh, at a given day, in any 24 hour period, how many would, uh, will be uh, uh, actively staffing? We have, uh, essentially we have three, three ambulances that are staffed around the clock, 24 hours a day. And then of course, when we get busy and have to have a fourth or a fifth rig, then we start calling in <coughs> off-duty personnel. Thankfully that doesn't happen every day, but it does happen. And so we, we do that <coughs> and um, uh, it, it works real well. We also have, uh, uh, for the third, for the third out rig, not the first or the second, but the third out rig, we have uh, two medics for the first rig, two medics for the second rig, and then one medic for the third rig. And then, if we need that third rig, we typically will use uh, one of the EMTs from Lincoln Rural, who's right our next door neighbors. They're right there. Yeah. Uh, and they go on the call f uh, with us uh, to. Uh, help us and that works out really well because we don't have to have quite as much staff um, they're there and um, and they you know glean income from us because of their or use uh, from us and we glean the fact that we don't have to have yet another full-time person on duty 24 hours a day mm -hmm. so that helps us as well staffing that would be like staffing hospital you know you don't know how many you'll need but you have to have enough for what you'll need which you have no idea about now that's got to be say? a conundrum <laughs> <laughs> I, I asked you not to ask any hard questions <laughs> i'm already lost <laughs> so am i and yes, i said yes. it <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, it is difficult, but historically speaking, well, here's another point. I mean, I remember when we started in the 70s, we had two ambulances, and that was sufficient for the time because we only ran about 2,000 calls a year. Over the years, even though the population has not grown, the, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, uh, need for the ambulances more than doubled. We're running 4,500 calls a year mm. uh, and there's a multitude of reasons for that. Part of it is the 911 system. Part of it is the fact that uh, medicine has turned so much more sophisticated that the local hospital will you know treat a person and then they ship them out to a specialist and so subsequently we run lots of transfers to other hospitals uh -huh. mostly to Springfield but we go to Decatur and Bloomington and Peoria and really? other places as well mm -hmm. taking patients there and how many people go on each run Two. how many people are employed by the paramedics full-timers we have 18 uh, uh -huh. part-timers I think the full count now is 42 I think 42 people uh, we have to have a lot of part-timers um, because you know people well our, our full-timers they have uh, vacations uh, they get sick uh, and then the part-timers we have such a great plethora of them because they all work Elsewhere. And so yeah. you have to have a plethora of them to call through until you find somebody that's available. Oof and done. so that, that kind of, I mean, if you had part-timers that were just sitting at home waiting for the phone, to come, you wouldn't have to have so many, but th that's the reason why we have so many. And then part of it also is we have now employed nurses for our critical care uh, system that we do. We How many were there when you started? How many employees were there? <laughs> well, in, in those days, you uh, the the medics were divided into half uh, the the uh, the uh, ambulances were owned and operated by and the drivers were were paid by Decatur ambulance service oh. mm -hmm. and then the attendants or the EMT was uh, employed by the hospital and so you take that down i think at the time maybe there was only maybe eight or nine of us at the most at the, at, at, and now there days. are 42 and that you right that's a jump well speaking <laughs> of full-timers right. and part-timers we have some full-time sponsors <laughs> and we're going to stop and take a minute to recognize those full-time sponsors and then we're going to come right back and talk to steve saltman 
Right back live in the studios here of WLCN, Programmer's Viewpoint, and our guest this morning, along with the illustrious co-host Judith K. Busby, uh, Mr. Steve Silkman. Uh, Judy kind of mined uh, him a couple weeks ago to uh, come in here. We've been talking about having Steve up here, and sure enough, uh, we were able to make it work in a hurry. Uh, Steve is uh, really uh, has a, a very, very important job in our community, a very demanding job. Uh, without uh, the group that he leads, uh, we'd be picking with the chickens if we had emergencies. So, uh, really? Uh, uh, now, I'm thinking last uh, we had that terrible tragedy just down the street from us uh, uh, when that semi came on to this, that you were involved in that. And I got to thinking. With the traffic backup and all, that had to make it kind of physically very difficult for you to get an ambulance close to the scene of the of the tragedy. Uh, I was not on that call. Sure. Uh, of course, it was uh, you know another the other bunch that were on that day. Um, they uh, Atlanta Fire, Atlanta Rescue, uh, Logan, uh, see Lincoln Rural, Lincoln City Fire. Uh, of course, all the f- law enforcement. There were so many people involved in that because yeah. it was such a tragic situation with oh, so my. many things to do. Yeah. And uh, two of those individuals were transported by air. Um, the uh, Peoria Life Flight bunch took a couple of them out. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so, but it, yeah, it was. Uh, it was. It's. A, it's. A, you know, there is no way that that our service could do. Uh, need even close to the, the job that it does without all these fire departments and rescue squads around the county. Mm-hmm. They are absolutely vital. Uh, they do a wonderful job. Most of them are volunteers. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of them are paid, but uh, most of them are volunteers around the county. And, and I just, uh, whenever I get an opportunity, I like to give them kudos because, you know, volunteers are. Uh, amazing people because they're not doing that to make a living they're just doing it because it's community service need and so Mm -hmm. they're just there to do whatever they need to do and they're great great people now you mentioned uh, uh, the airlift situation in this case we uh, uh, who makes the decision on site to bring in uh, uh, airlift a helicopter to get these or are the patients transported to the hospitals first and then Right the, from the field site. Right, and we don't generally use airlift too much from the field, but there are certain situations that warrant it. And the paramedics, when they arrive at the scene, they make an assessment of the situation, and say we're going to have to have a helicopter or two on this situation. Mm-hmm. And so they get them called out. They they're pretty fast. I mean, uh, Peoria has. I think they call them jet helicopters. They're very very fast. They can get up and in the air and down here pretty quick uh-huh. uh, and uh, speed sometimes is a vital situation with traumas mm-hmm. uh, and uh, so in those rare such and like I say it doesn't happen every day but it does happen from time to time where we do need an ambulance or a mm-hmm. air ambulance so uh, now when you send somebody out on, on a tragedy like that some individual is, is in charge somebody has to be in charge of the of the troops uh, would that be uh, somebody that you appoint uh, uh, well, before, before the, the accident happens? The lead paramedic or the one who has basically the most experience would be the medical person in charge. And of I course, see. then you've got your police departments, whoever's there first usually mm-hmm. is the one that's in charge as far as keeping the traffic out of the sure. way and yeah. doing whatever they got to do. Uh, and then uh, the fire department, whoever is uh, the first to respond, the chief or their designate is the one that's in charge of uh, of helping the, the medics or helping to keep the traffic away from the, the uh, site. So a lot of things to do. You know, I've, I've heard people talk about the fact that they question why when the ambulance comes to your home or the scene of any problem where they're needed, why they don't just put the patient in the ambulance and take off quick, quick, quick. Well, that's the old-fashioned way. Mm -hmm. And now, today, there's a lot that's done in the ambulance. Maybe you could talk a little bit about stabilizing a patient. Well, you know, there's no way that we could... um, 
actually make an assessment or treat somebody appropriately if we just threw them on the cot and took off. I mean, mm -hmm. we have to find out, you know, if, if we get to a patient and, and we don't know anything about them, you know, we're going to start out with their vital signs and say, oh, I've got low blood pressure, or they're not conscious. Well, what is that going on? Are they a diabetic? So we take their blood sugar and most of the time we find out their blood sugar is low and we have to give them the sugar. The fact of the matter is, is that, that many or most of the initial treatments that patients get uh, from the ambulance service at the scene are not any different than what they would get at the emergency room initially. Now, mm -hmm. going farther, you know, and getting deeper into the treatment and so forth, obviously they need to go to the hospital where the doctor can make assessments and get laboratory in there taking blood and things of that nature and x-rays and things. But initially speaking, there's no difference. Right. But I think, I think sometimes people are so frightened mm -hmm. when the ambulance has to come that it probably seems like they're out there for three hours when it isn't <laughs> it very does. long at all. It probably does. And waiting for the ambulance. You know, if it's five minutes, it probably seems like a half hour to them. Oh, yes. And, uh, you know, our response times are, are really good because of the rescue squads. I mean, you know, if you get hurt in San Joe's, mm -hmm. that's a long ways from Lincoln. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you got a San Joe's fire department that's going to be there within five minutes or something to, you know, get things started. Whether that's, you know, stopping bleeding or, or uh, you know, give them some oxygen or whatever. I mean, we usually know what we're getting into before we get into these. Out because in of the communication county. back and forth between oh, the rescue. Absolutely, yeah. We have radio contact and and telephone contact and so so forth. A so thing that's noted is when you and you've seen it at your house many times, when, but um, when an ambulance arrives at a house, there's not a hurry, helter skelter. Uh, it's a very quiet, very professional, low key. Uh, One has to. They have. Um, they're 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 going in this very slowly, and they're thinking they're not being slow, but they're being very deliberate and very careful as to what uh, how they're working with the patient. Absolutely. You already um, got a house full of panicky people. You don't have to add to that, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, that's where experience comes in. You get uh, somebody that's brand new to this uh, to this uh, type of work, and yeah, they're going to be helter-skelter for a little while until they kind of settle into it but the thing that is is experience uh, teaches all of these people you know when when you get in a hurry you make mistakes mm -hmm. and you need to you need to take your time not to the point where you're being ridiculous but you need to think about what you're doing before you do it especially when you're talking about people's welfare oh yeah exactly now you have ongoing training Tell us a little bit about your, uh, you know, just because they got their certification, certification, get that right to a minute, uh, that doesn't mean that they're good for the rest of their job tenure. Mm -hmm. So you have to have ongoing, and how often is that, Steve? Well, characteristically, um, it, it, it depends on the season, but we, we usually try to have something every month. Now, the state requires us for our licensure that we have to have, uh, I, think, I think it's 20 hours of continuing education and so many hours of field work, but we far surpass that, and so we never really worry about what the state wants because we can mm -hmm. prove that we do a lot more than what we need to. Mm -hmm. It's important, even if we're going over something we've been over a hundred times before, it's important to do these things because I'll, I'll give you an example um, pediatrics we don't get a lot of pediatric mm -hmm. patients thank God yeah, amen yeah. Mm -hmm. but when you get a pediatric it might be it might have been six months before you had your last one you can forget things simple things mm -hmm. and so you know it's important to continue to have educational uh, you know go back over it again let's go it again you know again and again again until it becomes part of your nature why is that a different sort of treatment than with an adult? Well, I think just the psyche alone. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, you know, when people have to deal with children, I think I think just the idea of that alone is enough to heighten your senses. But beyond that, your medication treatment modalities are, are cut down way, way, way down because yeah, everything's done by kilograms, uh, weight, and, and uh, so you have to be careful about what medications you give and how much. Right. 
if you have to give medications. When you do have uh, little people, is it more often that they've had an accident and fallen from afar? or more often that they've eaten something they would be better off not having well, eaten? I think uh, probably uh, pre-existing issues are probably our most common oh, okay. common thing. Obviously, children get hurt, but I mean, generally speaking, what you're dealing with is somebody has a pre-existing issue of some mm -hmm. sort, and um, uh, whether they uh, you know, it could be some kind of a, a disease or some type mm -hmm. of illness or whatever the plump. Uh, but uh, 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 fevers uh, are dangerous to children because they can spike a temp quicker than a normal person, and when and they can they can cause uh, too much temperature can cause brain damage. Mm -hmm. You want to get on top sure. of that, right, Steve? When you're uh, people might want to know uh, uh, what do these guys do? They're not sitting around reading uh, uh, magazines, uh, training. That yeah. you do all the time on, on site there. Uh, they have uh, your equipment that uh, vital. They have to uh, maintain that, keep it up, keep it clean. Right. And uh, uh, so there's a lot that your uh, your attendants, your your specialists, do while they're on duty. Well, and 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 again, that there's a little magazine time, but we understand that there are times when. We are so busy that nobody's had a chance to do anything all day long except run calls. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I mean, uh, and then there's other days where there's not a lot going on, and during those days, and they can do a double check on things, you know, wash a rig or whatever, mm -hmm. and do whatever they have to do to kind of keep things in uh, in condition. And then there are times when it's slow enough if they want to go upstairs and watch TV or take a nap. Sure, that's fine because they're ready to a go. A lot of times, I mean, they work 24-hour shifts, so that means. So they're going to have to sleep sometime. Can't yeah. watch that truck all day long. Yeah, right, right, <laughs> exactly. So we have that for them as well. They got a living room. It's and a, a nice facility. Uh, yeah, right. mm -hmm. It's a very nice facility. Nothing plush or anything about it, but it's just a, a nice, comfortable facility for them. Mm -hmm. We're uh, so heavily agricultural in this whole area, um, and harvest season is coming up. Is that a busier season for you than? planting season? It can be, uh, but I wouldn't say that it's, uh, you know, yeah, certainly, I mean, you're going to have more injuries uh, with regard to that on uh, planting and harvesting. Those are the two times when, because you know, that's when they're out there working. Mm -hmm. And yes, you can have accidents uh, more, more so there than any place. Um, uh, I think, uh, though, that when you take a look at our overall call volume, most of our uh, deal, most of our what we take care of are automobile accidents, heart issues, um, strokes, um, respiratory issues, and of course, you know, you got uh, people uh, with uh, on drugs and and have, oh, yeah. you know taking taking overdoses and things of that nature. What's that uh, doing for you now? This uh, this drug epidemic is becoming more and more epidemic ish. Yeah, well, uh, what I've been, what I've understood is that uh, back years ago, whenever you would hear of, uh, you know, some, you know, like a, a wealthy person, they would, you know, they had uh, an overdose of uh, some type of, of narcotic or, uh, and, and now, it was really only available. Some of those things were only available to the rich. Now yeah. it's not so because it's it's anywhere a on lot the cheaper and it's yeah. and it's it is available. Um, uh, it, it is somewhat what I would call epidemic proportions, but it's not any different here than it is anywhere else. I'm sure. Um, and uh, I think uh, the bottom line is how do you fix that? I really don't know the answer to that question. I think. It's a matter of the heart. I think people have always looked for something yeah. to take the pain away or something to get a little recreation or escape life in some manner. Unfortunately, some of these uh, uh, drugs that are available, um, you know, it, it can start you on a road, a spiral road, because once you start that, you, then you become addicted, and then the first thing you know, you're you don't have enough money to pay for your drugs and so you start stealing and, yep. and I mean it just causes all kinds of uh, problems. Um, 
but m my my personal feeling about the whole issue as a whole is is that there's not enough uh, institutions available for people to get help mm -hmm. because people you know they'll they'll get in trouble and then they have to wait for six months to get into a rehab yeah. center yeah. well you know they're back out on the street what are they going to do they're going to get remedicated and then we start the cycle cycle all, over. all around yeah. if there were enough institutions to get people in immediately i think that would help a lot and it would help with the overcrowded prisons as well i think so mm -hmm. philosophical question uh, for you uh, what do you think about medicinal marijuana steve you know, I'm going to withhold my uh, <laughs> opinion hey, about that. I robbed him, I robbed him a hard one, to eat and, and he wouldn't drop at the net. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to withhold my <laughs> opinion there on that one. No, I don't know why you're withholding your opinion. He and I are just like gumball machines. Our opinion forms in our head, and it's out our mouth. No filter. <laughs> Didn't even filter. <laughs> well, you know, there's there's arguments on both sides of the equation. Oh, yeah. Oh, and, sure. and both of them, both of them have valid, very valid points. Mm -hmm. That's the trouble with life. There are two sides to everything. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Yeah. <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> Go ahead, Mrs. Bugby. I thought you had something before we, that clock is about to expire. I know. And I don't want to Well, I did want to ask him about the farm accidents, but you know, with the machinery having become so much more sophisticated and the farm people having become so much more aware of the awful things that could happen if they were careless for a second i imagine that's cut down on that kind absolutely. of thing a lot since the good old days absolutely that's that's that was a perfect point and and i wish i'd even thought of that but that is true and and, and that also plays into the car accidents as well yes they do still to happen but i can tell you that they're not near as many automobile accidents that are so severe as they used to be because people have to wear seat belts, cars are more safe, uh, the alcohol laws are such that, you know, many people that used to drink and get in a car and drive, they don't do it anymore. And uh, um, yeah, there are some that do, but I'm just saying that that's kind but of But there are fewer. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, now, I just traded in my 20-year-old car for a new car uh, i've decided she didn't that need every to. she just wanted to i did every 20 <laughs> years whether i need it or not i'm going to get a new car so i thought when i got it gosh this certainly isn't built like my 20 year old car was it was kind of a distant cousin to a sherman tank you know and i i just wondered about having accidents and the thing crumbling like paper well uh, they, they 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 are technically they are except for the little small cars yeah. that are, don't have any weight to them but your normal car is actually built better even though it may be lighter than what it used to be because um, of the, the way they make it and i i don't understand all that but i do know that that's true and the airbags that are on the sides and the front and mm -hmm. all that must make a difference protects, protects people from whenever whenever the you know they don't bang their head on something or get thrown out of the windshield i mean we we used to have cars where people would actually get thrown through a windshield oh, yeah. mm -hmm. and yeah. you don't hardly ever see anything like that anymore now Dude. how about car seats for babies i've got my car seat on the passenger side in the back mm -hmm. because i thought what if my my seat would collapse and hit him. Mm -hmm. So what do you advise for people who have car seats in their car for babies? Well, the one thing I have advised is to make sure that they read the instructions because it tells specifically how to set up, a, set those up and where to put it. Uh, I, I, I'm even guilty of getting something and I, I can figure this out and, yeah, and then eventually when I mess everything up then I have to go back to the uh, instructions. All else fails, well, yeah. it, we're all kind of that way, but that would be the first thing I would do is read the instructions and do what it says. Mm -hmm. Our guest this morning has been to Mr. Steve Silt. When the clock has hit that point again, we gonna, I keep talking about this each Wednesday. We're never able to stop that clock, so we have to live with that. Uh, Steve is uh, in charge of our Golden County Paramedics Association out there on the west side of town. That's a tremendous amount of good. Uh, by the way, um, we see these folks. Thank them. Um, it's kind of like uh, uh, Cop Lives Matter. 
these guys are doing a tremendous job for us, and uh, we're not trying to stroke you here on the air, Steve, but uh, we appreciate the work that you do because it uh, it's vital to those to those who need it. Thank you. Uh, you bet. So we always try to close uh, with a uh, comment about the subject matter of the day, and we're talking about emergencies today. I found one that had a difficult time finding a serious uh, quote. Atlanta Turner, she was a pinup oh. girl of the uh, World War II days. That's where they put the pictures up in the barracks, Judith K. Yes, I remember. Oh, I, I, just wanted, I just want to straighten that out to you, what I meant by <laughs> pin up. Okay. Vanna says, my life has been a series of emergencies. Well, I guess she's right about that. Thank you, <laughs> Steve Siltman, and thank you, Judith K.